Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season. Now, for those who haven't tuned in before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media setup here at AFC Bournemouth. Now, it wouldn't be an AFC Bournemouth podcast without the man sat alongside me. As ever, I'm joined by my colleague Neil Perrett here at Vitality Stadium. He's been covering the club for over 30 years. Neil, how are you? Are you all organised for Christmas? I'm very well, Zoe, thank you. Um, And I'm not a Christmas fan, so no, I'm not organised at all. (laughs) Leaving that one all to the missus. Now then, we often refer to Neil as our very own Mr Bournemouth, but today's guest could rival him for that title. He arrived at the club over 10 years ago and has cemented his status as a true club legend. Over 350 appearances in red and black and now at the club captain. It's a privilege to welcome Steve Cook onto the AFC Bournemouth podcast. Cookie, it's great to see you. How are things? Yeah, really good, thanks. Um, unlike Neil, I'm a Christmas fan, so I'm all ready. Um, and it was a bit of a bit of a strange one, Neil, you saying that, actually, but I thought you was very festive and uh, a jolly guy, but you know. Well, there we go. I'm sure we might come on to that a little <laughs> bit later on. Now then, we've got plenty to get through and lots to cover. But first things first, we want to start with the here and now. After those two amazing blocks at Fulham... Did you ever fancy yourself as a goalkeeper? They were quite something. Well, saying that, Zoe, uh, from a few years ago, I think I had the same kind of re- questions. So it was nice to actually block it with uh, a part of my body that was legal at the time. So um, <laughs> I, I've been known, I've, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a decent goalkeeper. So um, back in the day, I actually started as a goalkeeper as a kid, um, then used to get frustrated and then got out on pitch and scored a few goals. So. I've I've always I've always had it in the locker, but luckily last Friday was was a legal block. Have you ever uh, have you ever done anything like that before? Obviously, it wasn't just one block; it was two blocks. They just sort of came at you. You can't have known too much about them. Um, I like blocking the ball, you know, um, big head um, and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it was it was enjoyable. Um, I kind of felt a little bit. Honestly, I had a little bit of whiplash on Monday. And I've had a bad neck this week, so I'm putting it down to the block rather than being old or getting older. So, um, yeah, I enjoy that side of the game. So um, it was it was quite pleasing. You know, I know we didn't beat Fulham, but it must have been a brilliant game to be involved in. It was end to end and and lots going on. Yeah, it was. Um, it reminded me of a of a Premier League game. Uh, I thought Fulham were were very good, and you can see why they're up there with us. Um, obviously, we would have. Love to have held on, but um, I did think it was a, it was a good game, great game for the championship. Um, Bournemouth and Fulham are setting the standards so far, and um, I think it will take a very good team to kind of break that, saying that we we need to get back to winning ways soon. The the pundits are saying it's going to be us and Fulham are the two teams to catch in the championship, but you've been in the game long enough to know there's a long way to go. Yeah, especially the championship. You know, you don't really see too many teams running away too early. Um, It always goes down to the last kind of few in the season. So um, there's still so much football to be played, Um, but the lads and and, and the staff are relishing it. We know where we, what we've got to do with the standards we've set this year. So um, yeah, it could be said, it's easy to say because we're top two right now, but um, I think if we can kind of get back on the horse and, and win a game quickly we can go on another run now I know you haven't been involved as much as you would have liked in the first half of the season but what have you made of what the team have achieved in the first half of the season yeah I thought they were outstanding the, the football we played um, a very very tactical um, very structured um, the way we've played and the passing patterns and the intensity that the lads went into the games with uh, the intensity that the, the management staff kind of take training, um, very clever coaches. And yeah, they were, it was really enjoyable to watch. Um, as a Bournemouth fan, you know, you want to see that and um, scoring goals, keeping clean sheets, players running, tackling, winning headers, um, like kind of full body performances. And um, definitely the standout team so far. Um, so yeah, I think as a Bournemouth fan as well, it was it's great to see. Being near the top of the championship, playing in the Premier League, that was all a very, very long way off when you came here in October 2011 from Brighton. Just tell us 
what the how the move came about oh, for having four four stands would have been a nice achievement for the club back then um so yeah the, you can the premier league was miles off but yeah the the move come about it was nice i kind of was waiting to have an opportunity in league football um lee bradbury and uh, steve fletcher i think come and watch their game i played in the i think it was the carling cup back then against liverpool i played here for the uh for brighton reserves as well and uh, had a good game so and and then you could do month loans which i think is a huge miss in football right now uh, for young players but um yeah it was a great opportunity because the week before two weeks before port vale had come in for me and brighton had said no which turned out to turned out lovely for me in the end obviously but um i wasn't expecting a loan bournemouth came in and it was something i don't think brighton at the time could turn down for myself you mentioned those one month emergency loans that's exactly what you came in on you had one training session and then you went on to win man of the match on your debut a 3-1 win at preston what are your recollections of that day um i think i was quite <sighs> naive really as a as a footballer i didn't really go into the game worried or scared because i never really had it so i was looking forward to it i'd been coached extremely well at brighton under poye um, I think Bournemouth wanted to go down like a similar route and, and had always had that kind of passing from the back and composed kind of style so yeah we went 1-0 down I think that day as well um, come back and went on a, a nice run um, but yeah really enjoyable game at a, a historic club like Preston as well to win um, yeah strange one for myself because I probably didn't appreciate first team football at all by not playing in too much of it so yeah um Probably took it in my stride, but without really realising kind of what the level was then. Now, there were some real characters in that squad. We're talking Adam Barrett, Mark Pugh, Harry Arter, Steve Fletcher, Warren Cummings. How did they help you settle in? Did they help you settle in quickly? Um, I always remember the, the coach up. And I couldn't believe what was happening, to be honest. Um, I, I, can't, I know this is a casual podcast, but I can't even tell you what was going on. Um, and I was fr like, it threw me massively. It was a, a real eye opener to kind of men's football and the the antics that possibly could take place. And yeah, I'd, I'd add Scott Malone into that kind of bunch of characters, definitely. Um, Adam Barrett, I see him a couple of weeks ago at Millwall. Great guy, great guy. I uh, love him. He, he was fantastic uh, for myself as well, being a young defender and an experienced uh, captain at the time, Ads was. Um, so yeah, the, I wouldn't say I got welcomed. Uh, I would have said I got thrown into the deep end and kind of had to sing that night as well. It was different. <laughs> if you compare <laughs> that group of players to the current squad now, is there a big joker in there? <laughs> yeah, there were jokers, but it's totally different, you know. Um, uh, yeah, it's a long, long time ago. I think you could, it was totally different. The, the they were saying about that, you got away with back then to what you what the lads are used to now is totally different um we've got a great group now um a lot of young players who are kind of starting on the journey as well really good players um really good personalities similar to I kind of compare it to where we was at uh, last time we was in the championship when we went up but it's different you know um when last time we had Harry Arter, Simon Francis, Cannon Wilson, Junior Sanders, Goslin Smithy's obviously still here so hard to compare both squads really but similar sort of kind of um, personalities People often say that there aren't very many characters in the game these days is that something you agree with? No I think it's a different sort of character uh, there's definitely characters so Chris Meppham um, great character but totally different character to Harry Arter so the it's still there. It's it's totally different. The change room now from what I was used to five, six years ago is it, totally different. Uh, it's still really nice to be involved in. Still a, a place, a change room that you would you don't want to be out of. It's it's, it's the best place. I, I love it. Um, but the transition from ten years ago, twelve years ago to to what it is now, there's a different sort of character. It's nice. Um, back in the day. Yeah, I think when I was at Brighton, when you a kid coming through, it was borderline. 
kind of on the edge of a slight bit of bullying and harsh realities and it was hard you know coming through that that era let alone what it was <laughs> years and years ago so now I think football is a the change room is a nice place it's a great place to be you can create friends and um, and it transpires onto the pitch if you've got a happy dressing room I think it's probably fair to say there was a lot going on off the pitch behind the scenes at this club when you when you first arrived I know you were really young and you were in the relegation zone when you first came in what were your early memories of the club off the pitch yeah it was a, it was a strange one because I was I come from quite a, a stable club as in Brighton very very well structured and they were pushing the stadium was getting built it was obviously the training ground in the in the pipeline and the club was on the move upwards and I come to Bournemouth and it was in transition and they wanted that I think um, and the ownership was was different the owner come into the dressing room a couple of times pulled meetings um, obviously Fletch stood down as an assistant manager I think maybe a week or two weeks after I'd been here um, so yeah, it was it was a strange one. Uh, I didn't really know what to think, to be honest, and I couldn't really see past my initial loan at the time. So, it kind of went over my head. But I was thinking, oh, yeah, this is a <laughs> this is different. Um, just try and play well, you know. Um, try and play well and and see what happens. And um, the f the kind of off field stuff was something I probably didn't even realise what was happening. It was it was really strange, but. I look back at it now and it's kind of just shows how far the club are coming and, and it's an amazing, amazing job that the guys behind the scenes have done. So football aside, when you came down, I think you were 20 at the time, what what was it like off the pitch for you? Where were you living and you know, sort of going out, meeting people and stuff like that? Or did you just commute from Brighton? How did it all work? No, so I actually got put in digs. So it was a, it was a weird one because a month before I just moved in with a couple of mates from Brighton, <laughs> and then a month later, I'm moving in with a family in Bournemouth. I, I went in a house with Wes Fogden. Um, really nice family. Um, I still see them every so often. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I felt I was going back to, to kind of live with my mum and dad. So it wasn't a, a, a move that I thought I'd be making, moving in with a, a couple with three kids. Um, enjoyed it. It was totally different. I knew Wes from Brighton. The lads were quite warm in here um, and instantly made friend with, with, with Joe Partington, who was quite eager of me to, to move out of the, the digs and, and whatnot. But I remained in there for, I think, I don't know how, I think until I signed permanently, which was quite nice. It was uh, quite warming, but I love Bournemouth. Uh, the, it was it was new, night, the, the nightlife. Um, coming from Hastings, there was no real, it wasn't lively. It was old school pubs, you know, it still is. Come to Bournemouth, stag do's and, and whatnot. At 20, I was loving it. And we was winning as well, so it gave me an excuse that we could pop out. But players who move into digs, I, I know it um, goes back to this is a long-standing family with this. The Sullivan family put up people like Rio Ferdinand and Jermaine Defoe and Jason Tindall and people like that. Do you, you said, do you still keep tabs with the family you were in with? Yeah, I, I see them every so often around town. Um, they were really good to me, to be honest. Um, and they've all turned out. The, the the kids turned out really well. They're a lovely, um, lovely group. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a big moment for them. Well, not big moment. It's probably the wrong word. But to take to take players in that they don't know, I think it's really nice. You know, the family to do that now, I think it's, it's amazing. Um, but it was big for me. I really appreciate it because obviously you go to somewhere and feel at home. You're going to be happier. So they done that. It was a lovely house. Um, I had a nice room, probably the best room in, in the house, which was nice. Thank the club for that. Um, and, and maybe for welcome. And I've loved, I love Bournemouth ever, the, the day I got down to till now. You know, I love it. So um, I, I say thank you to them. Back when you first sort of signed in your first few years, you struck up a very good friendship with Jaden Stockley. And I think that remains strong today. How did that all develop? Was that just a case of playing with each other and just getting on really well? Um... It was a weird one because actually when I first signed, he went on loan to Accrington Stanley. So it was kind of 
me, Joe Partington, uh, eventually Donald McDermott, Jaden would come back here and there and got got friendly and uh, myself, Joe and, and Jaden are still very good friends now, um, all these years later. So uh, you don't often get that in football, especially when they moved quite a while ago, but we speak all the time, um, most days. So yeah, lucky, lucky really. They, they've done, both done really well um, and really good boys. It kind of goes to show what Bournemouth is about. You you do get a very good education down here as in how to grow up, how to come through like the scholarships and um, Joe Roach and whatnot that, that kind of coach them and, and give them um, a really good chance to become a, a good man. You were sometimes spotted watching the Pool Pirates down at Speedway. Did you ever fancy a go yourself? No. Uh, no. Those guys are absolutely nuts. Um, yeah, I used to go down with, with Woz, um, Matt Ford. Uh, obviously ran it there, now his son does. Yeah, I used to go down there quite quite a bit, really enjoyed it. Um, got to know a few of the racers as well who kind of go hand in hand with the, the madness there. The, yeah, the, the crazy. Chris Holder, I remember back then, was was mental, uh, an unbelievable rider. Darcy Ward, obviously, who had a horrific crash and um, obviously extremely sad, but those two, I remember watching them too, and they were they were amazing. I think Paul were, won everything back then, and cool. that, that takes some bravery. And yeah, to, I think after that uh, that incident, that was when I kind of stopped watching because uh, there was a a guy I can't remember what he was called now who used to race. He was from Hastings or Bexhill, and he actually died doing that sport. And he kind of then changes. You couldn't really watch it the same way, so. I haven't watched it since then. When we compare it to vehicles with four wheels, you're quite into your cars, aren't you? Just tell us a little bit about that, how that all started and, and you know, a bit more about that. Um, yeah, uh, I do like cars. Um, but I always said to myself when I was going, growing up, if I ever got to a decent level of football, I'd get myself a nice car because I was dry, I had uh, Fiat Puntos and crashed. Crashed my fate, crashed my first one after a, a month of, of having it, which was devastating. I actually told my mum that I think oh, it was me and my best friend. We were driving into um, into training down the country lanes, January time. Hit some black ice, and uh, kind of went over, hit the hit the bank and rolled. So um, I always after that thought to so I had to obviously downgrade into a a, a lesser punto at the time, and thought to myself if I, if I ever get a good contract, I, I'd treat myself to a nice car and. Luckily enough for me, I've over the years at Bournemouth been lucky and um, treat myself, yeah. So if you had all the money in the world, what car would you buy? Um, all the money in the world, for oh. I would go for, I think, the Lamborghini Urus. I think it's got a little bit of class with a little bit of sound as well, so I'd go for that one. That's the one we've seen you driving into training with, isn't it? Because you have got all the money in the world. Not for you? me, no, not for me, no. Um, I wish. I didn't quite win the Euro Millions on Tuesday night, so still hanging on to them them dreams. But, you know, if, if I do win the Euro Millions, no, I'll, I'll buy you one as well. Now then, a little, little secret coming out of the bag here. In the car park the other day, we saw you with an app and a car. Can you explain what you were doing with Lewis Cook? <laughs> yeah, so I just got a Tesla, the Model 3, and... Um, uh, I added on obviously the self-drive stuff and it let me down under pressure um, because we actually saw Keely and Leanne who worked for the club walking around and they kind of formed a little audience and the car let me down um, so Elon if you're listening mate yeah, I, want my, I want my money back for the self-drive because it's having one um, so, but yeah I was devastated and Lewis was devastated as well because we wanted the, the car to drive to us and it didn't, it really let us down. So that might be me being lazy or not, but yeah, Elon, you have one, mate. You said you had an audience of Keely and Leanne. I take it you didn't know you had an audience of the media team as well? No, no, no. So it's, it's, it's even more embarrassing now. <laughs> so um, I try, I go away, look at myself, give it a go again. Uh, if not, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's a real shame. Back onto the football now. 
January 2012. You just played for Brighton in a 3-0 win against Southampton. You kept people like Adam Lallana and Ricky Lambert quiet in that game. And then you signed permanently here. That was a very quick transition from playing for the Brighton first team to signing here. I think it was about £170,000. Yeah, bargain, eh? Um, now, that was a weird, really, really strange one for me because I actually, a week before I'd gone back to train with Brighton, to, well, originally I went back to speak to them to see what was going on in January and I ended up training for two days, which was a weird one. And then I had a phone call from Poyo saying, you're in the squad at the weekend. I was like, I can't be. He was like, why? I was like, oh, I'm still, I'm still on loan at, at Bournemouth. I'm playing for them at the weekend. He was like, I'll call you back. <laughs> so I was like, what's going on? What is going on here? So they called me back. They were like, right, you are still on loan. I was like, yeah, I know. Like, I've got a game. They're like, right, play the game. And then just let's see what happens. So I played the game. I don't know. I don't know who we played or what the score was. Yeovil. Was it Yeovil? Did we win? So way at Yeovil, I think we won. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, played that game. Drive back from Yeovil. Had a phone call from Charlie Oatway, who was the coach at Brighton, and I was really close with him. He kind of sorted out my, he sorted out my Bournemouth flyer, and obviously back then there wasn't loan managers, but he kind of took that upon himself to to help me out. Rang me. He was like, oh, um, Lewis Dunk. Suspended, I think, or injured, picked up a knock. So, you're going to be coming back to play. I was like, okay. But at that point, I'd already kind of agreed that I would sign for Bournemouth. So, my agent at the time was like, you can't play. I was like, well, I have to. Like, this is what I want. Like, I was desperate to play for Brighton at the time. Obviously, loved my time at Bournemouth. Desperate to play. I ended up playing right back, 1 3 0. And after the game, they pulled me in and said, look, if you don't want to go, we'll kind of offer you the same contract here, but we can't guarantee that you're going to play. You'll play the next game. I think it was against Wrexham in the FA Cup and then we'll see what happens. And it just didn't feel right. I felt like I had promised myself and Lee Bradbury at the time that I would sign. And I decided to kind of, back what I said um, and yeah drove down I'd actually signed in Blue Water a shopping centre um, by London Way signed there and, and yeah the rest is history I was made up and I don't regret anything I loved it and I love it now so yeah strange, really strange kind of few days myself um, I had a few phone calls on the way way back as well for for, for different kind of options but yeah, my, my heart really was set on Bournemouth. In a programme Q&A last season, you were asked Saints or Pompey and you went for Saints. How come? <laughs> I really, oh, I don't know, this might come back to kill myself in a few years' time. But I really, I, I love the atmosphere at, at Portsmouth. But the fans always gave me stick. And then I just really disliked them. One of those fans is sitting. Yeah, I'm not looking at her. <laughs> she might have actually been in the crowd. So, no, ge genuine. Like, um, I think Fratton Park and and their fa fans are, you know, one of the best. But yeah, I was a young player and I got abused a few times. So I thought, do you know what? I don't like you lot, and I've stuck with it. So, um, yeah, great. Great club, obviously very historic and not really a, a rival of, of Bournemouth, if really. Um, I, probably, I think they would shrug that off as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I chose Saints because, yeah, I have memories of the Portsmouth faithful giving me a bit of abuse and I've kind of held it against them, yeah. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, um, you'd been at Brighton since the age of nine. Was it difficult for you to leave? It wasn't, it wasn't. So... Like I said, I was desperate to to play for Brighton, but then when I when it boiled down to it, I loved everything about being a Bournemouth player. So no, not really. I I felt like I hadn't really been given a chance at Brighton, so it was more of a, do you know what? Thanks for the offer, but I'm gonna go 
to a club that kind of trusted me and, and wanted me to be there and not a kind of token gesture. So um, no, I don't regret leaving. It wasn't hard leaving at all. Um, it was something that I probably needed to, to branch out. And if I'd stayed there, I, there's no way I would have had the career that I had now. Are players like you still out there, you know, players that cost next to nothing but end up going on to play in the Premier League for, for five years? 100%. I think there's players in non-league and League 1, 2 that maybe don't get the chance. You have to be very lucky in football. There, there's You have to have someone really trust you. I had that. I was fortunate. But I was... I was on the verge of kind of being left behind. I've reached 20 and I think at 20, 21, you're then the pressure's kind of getting to you to, to then make a career. Um, I 100% believe that. I think there's a, so much talent in the English English leagues. I think now they're being used more because the money side, everyone wants a young player to succeed to kind of cash in. Whereas that wasn't the case Um years ago it's a young players game now and <clears throat> I definitely feel that uh, there are very talented footballers out there um, that just need that chance need that kind of push in first team football um, we have it here we've got some very good footballers in, in the under 23s that just need to go and play first team football need to kind of get a run that trust uh, to go on and have a, a very successful career so yeah I, I would I would say, yeah, there's there's plenty out there. They just need to be given that push of professional games for, for really competitive football. Um, and I don't think there's a better kind of way of kind of going through a career, playing in non-league, getting that kind of toughness, a different side of playing on not so good pitches. Once you've done that and you can go past that, I think it leads you. To, to a bright future. For you, you were signed by Lee Bradbury. You've spoken a bit about him already. He was replaced just over three months after you joined. What were you thinking then? I was gutted, really gutted, because it was the guy that gave me my uh, proper chance. I think he was very unfortunate, I must say. But in, at that time, there was a, a transition. Um, there was people behind the scenes that had an influence on that owner, the half owner, fifty percent owner at the time, to end up getting the job. I, it was a real, real harsh decision on brothers. Um, a guy that I really, really respected, really respect now. Um, kind of give me that chance, like I just spoke about, and yeah, I was, I was really gutted for him. Um, but you could, the players knew it was kind of happening. Because we'd had, like I say, just before it was quite strange. We had meetings with the owner and the time, and it was it was all over the place. I think it's probably fair to say, Cookie, that you experienced differing fortunes under Paul Groves, Lee Bradbury's replacement. And when, when we did a podcast with Tommy Elphick recently, you can say what you like about Paul. He felt that the the team were underachieving, irrespective of who whoever was the manager. The team was very much underachieving because we had a great squad, a great squad. Um, I think maybe the ideas were right that they had um, for my, for myself. Obviously, I wasn't playing much. I was playing. I played left back, right back a couple of times. They brought in Tommy uh, and Miles Addison, and and they were they were centre backs at the time. Obviously, I was young, used to playing. Probably didn't handle that too well. Um, but yeah, I wasn't wasn't delighted with the way um, that kind of period went. I think we was we was in the bottom four for a reason, um, and we ended up getting promoted that season for a reason also um, because we did have the best squad in the league. So yeah, it was um, a learning curve myself. Uh, again, a game of opinions, isn't it? It's uh, would I tell myself something different if I could speak to myself then? Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, it was, I, I was probably more disappointed because I knew how they got the job or in my mind, I thought how they got the job. So, um, and I was still quite loyal to to brothers at that time. Um, <laughs> I do remember that pre-season though. Um, 
we were <laughs> we were given the opportunity so you come in and so Dan Hodges if he listens to this he'll know as well so you could come in and do some running right and if you pass that test you've got an extra week off obviously strange one but at the time it was seven free 20s which is 320 meters so up back up back up and a little bit very hard run somehow I scrambled through the seven like I thought well, I just need this extra week off scramble through it but also they give us a, a list of stretches when they give it to an end of season I was like oh, come on mate it doesn't matter about stretches so I just bin the sheet <laughs> anyway little did I know after the runs we had to come in and go through the sequence of stretches <laughs> And they were like, right, Cookie, here we go. Right, can you do your six or seven stretches? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Like, just started doing it. And I obviously didn't get any of them right. And they brought me back in a week early. And I was so, <laughs> so devastated. And that, I think that was the start of my downfall because I couldn't do my stretches. So maybe, yeah, not, not obviously great professionalism for myself, but yeah, I, I didn't make... I did make the team potentially off some seven stretches, which was a funny run. So, Hodges, that's your fault, mate. <laughs> now, one game you did start in was the 4 0 defeat away at Swindon. I think you got top marks in the echo. I think I gave you three out of ten that day. What was your experience of playing against Matt Ritchie? Yeah, it wasn't great because, yeah, I played right back that day. And I remember the tactics before the game. And their best players were their wingers, Matt Ritchie and Gary Roberts, I think. And the striker up front, Andy Williams. Um, and they were very good down the sides, crossing the box, and we played a diamond. So uh, me being a right back was 2v1 every time. I think Simon Francis absolutely read the script and was injured. Um... <laughs> We started the game horrifically. I think the ball went under Wes Fogden's foot and Matty smashed one in. Um, it was a real bad day, real bad day. I think what summed it up, I think Addo, Miles Addison went to pass it back to Schwan. Was it Schwan, Jalau in goal or Flavs? And it went for a corner. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a bad one. It was a real bad one. Um, the lads in the change room, we, we knew it wasn't, we let ourselves down on the pitch. It wasn't just the manager. The the, the players were poor. Um, and I remember your article. I remember your report extremely well, Neil. Um, extremely well. And let me tell you, they weren't they weren't happy of you. Um, but yeah, fully deserved. It was it was atrocious. Uh, a real bad point, and actually, probably the clubs. I can't say in there history because the club went through some some terrible stuff but that that game was was as bad as it got I think on the pitch even though you were 20 21 in those early days you were always very personable and comfortable with the media is that an area you always felt okay in dealing with no I used to kind of I used to get really nervous for their interviews um, because I never was probably comfortable speaking and you never knew what I was going to come out with and if you could say it probably right now you never know what you can say and if if you're going to kind of listen to it back and regret it and think oh what have I done there um so yeah if I come across like that amazing um but I so I think it's you a part of the game where you have to really be respectful and face the music sometimes and be honest I used to always moan to the head of media and whatnot. I used to only get interviewed after the losses. <laughs> and I, I knew it. I would be walking in after a loss and I'd see him. I'd be like, oh yeah, all right, I'm coming out. I'd like, So I, I kind of, I didn't mind doing it. It was one of them where you, sometimes you, you get asked questions and you have to give the answer. <laughs> and then you read it after. And sometimes you read the comments after and you're like, you are right, but I, I had to say that, I'm sorry. And it's like, oh, yeah, we'll go again. We'll go again next week. We'll learn from it. It's like, oh, the fans must think, oh, he's saying it again. But I'd run out of answers because I was doing them quite regular. In the Premier League, don't win many games. 
he loses obviously a lot more. So, and I've been at the club where we we struggled as well. So, you find yourself going over and over and over the same kind of answers, but there's only so much you can say. So, it's very difficult. I think it's very difficult being a a footballer that's not. I wasn't amazing at school, you know, so it, it doesn't come easy coming up with, you know, the right things to say or you don't want to say the things for the sake of it. You want to mean it. And yeah, most of the time it was like, yeah, we're in there. We want to improve. We want to learn from what we're doing. But sometimes, you know, it's not what you want to hear. But so it's only what you can produce at, in an interview. And if you are losing regular, you have got to improve, obviously, in, in some aspects. So... Yeah, the media side, I think, it is is difficult. Sometimes it's set up to uh, here with the media sort of the papers and uh, the media side is, is perfect. But I'm guessing other clubs they kind of set you up to fail. So I've uh, been extremely lucky in in that respect. Now we've seen it with Tommy Elphick and Simon Francis. Is the media ever something you want to get into later down the line, or is it something you would just have no interest in? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, for myself, I wouldn't want to do it too too early because I think you can not retire yourself, but put like you're coming towards the end of your career. Um, so me being thirties, no, nah, not really. No, maybe. No, I might have an excuse, but no, I've got no interest. Um, I love football, you know, I, I really want to, I could talk about football a lot, but I'm not really interested in kind of giving opinions. I, I don't like giving opinions on other footballers when, you know, I I don't like criticising footballers when they make a mistake or because I've made plenty and I know what it's like to then read what it's about. You know, you don't need other footballers telling you. So yeah, no, I don't. I wouldn't enjoy that side. I don't think if if here and now maybe appear on something, but no. Nah. In terms of social media, do you love it or hate it? It's such a big talking point at the moment. I really like it. I don't like reading and seeing stuff that you get along with it. I think it's it's, it's awful. But I think social media is such a, a huge part in in life now. You have to take. So I, I'm not t- talking about the, the the racial side and and the the hate that you look you you see on there because that is just is is horrific, and it shouldn't be obviously allowed. There needs to be obviously ways of combating that. And there shouldn't be allowed fake accounts and and whatnot. So taking that way out of way out of things now, the social media, the good side, you can. It's, it's, it's so powerful. You can connect with people in the right way. Um, the videos and whatnot you see can brighten up your day of people kind of fooling around and and whatnot. Um, yeah, the connection with, I think, fans, especially at big clubs or whatnot, players, you can feel like alienated, you know, the, the fan kind of side of it. So little things that players do, I think, makes a huge difference uh, amongst the community and fans. So I think social media is so powerful. I think it's a a great platform if used correctly. Um, I love it. I like having sometimes, obviously, if I'm in a a good mood, kind of having a laugh and a joke on there. Um, You have to take the the rough of the smooth, obviously. If you want to be on there, you have to be prepared to receive kind of criticism on football and, and whatnot. But... I enjoy that as well. It makes me smile. It makes me laugh. So um, I like I like reading people's opinions on on myself um, here and there, as long as it's not too far. But yeah, I think I think it's a a good platform if if we can make it safe and respectful. For you, you've used your social media in a, a very positive way. We've seen you connecting with fans, like whether it's about a game or not. We've seen you reach out to the community. I remember in lockdown, you know, you're putting a tweet out there saying, if anyone's struggling, you know where I am and I'm here to listen. I think recently you met up with a fan that was having mental health issues. You really seem to be using it in such a positive way. Does that sort of, you know, give you a a good feeling, you know, when you can speak to fans like that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm a very lucky person, as in I, I have that a chance to kind of help. 
Um, I enjoy it. Obviously, lockdown. You read, I've read an awful lot of stuff about people struggling and whatnot. So, yeah, it was a chance for me to try and help in a period of time where people were really struggling and and whatnot. So, that I've always been that sort of person, kind of not just on social media and in normal life anyway, even if players are struggling or whatnot here. So. Um, yeah, it was an opportunity for, for m me to help. Uh, and yeah, I, I've never, I've got so much time on my hands, you know, um, so why not use it and kind of try and add something to to myself and learn about other people as well. Going back to the football, where it's October 2012. What were you thinking when Eddie Howe walked in through the door? I was... A bit scared obviously I knew I'd heard the stories of what he was like how in, how intense he was what his standards were really excited because I wanted to improve as a player um, and yeah it was he has <laughs> from the moment I first met Eddie to now my opinion and my the way I act around him is <laughs> <laughs> it's never changed. I'm still like <laughs> scared of him, in awe of him, and uh, yeah, I don't think I'll ever change. He's got that aura of him about him. When he first came, you were out of the team, and you were in and out of the team, not for the first time in your career under Eddie. What 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 was that like to start with? Uh, it was fine. I remember the I remember his first session. I laid down a marker. Um, we done a small sided tournament. Kevin Bond was there as well. Um, he was brought in to kind of pick out players. So it was like a one, two, three, who was best trainer, second, third, and then you, you got money. Um, I remember it well, because Moles absolutely bullied me to give my money away to, his, to, to something he was doing back then as well. So and that's why I remember it. But I ended up winning <coughs> player of the day. So I, I knew I knew he rated me as a player because I'd heard it before. Um, I probably wasn't fit enough uh, to be playing anyway because, like I say, under under the previous manager, I probably hadn't done enough whilst I was out of the team to perform when I got the chance. So maybe being out of the team when he first came in was, was a blessing in disguise because I got up to scratch. I was ready. I played in the FA Cup against Dagenham Redbridge, I think, um, with my first game for him played well obviously then wasn't in the team had to wait until the next FA Cup game maybe I think it was Carlisle um, but he always timed his interventions very well uh, with myself I think he always respected me as a player but then always wanted more as a person uh, I don't think he enjoyed the side of me going back to Hastings and being with my friends and going on kind of nights out and traveling. Um, so I think he always had that in him where he wanted to kind of be that headmaster type father, like get on it, like, come on. Uh, and then Miles got injured and then I got on the team and kind of never came out. Um, but that wasn't through <laughs> playing well every week. That was coming through a lot of big chats between me and him. Um, a lot of <laughs> a lot of him hammering me. To be honest with you, I was if he wasn't in charge, I could have been in and out of that team more regular than, than I was because he gave me good chances, you know. He he was always good. I think he always knew what was inside me. He was just desperate to get it out. Uh have that full commitment to football like he was as a as a player and a as a manager um, and and yeah, so I think that's why <clears throat> I kind of still got that opinion of him where I'm at with him. I always respect him so, so highly and I've still got that. I still get nervous when I talk to him. I get nervous when I saw him down at watching his kid play football and I was watching coaching. And I was like, oh, I wonder what he's gonna say to me. And we had no no football connection then. It was just like kind of 
a former player kind of friend chatting and I was still nervous and <laughs> scared what he was going to say to me. So, uh, yeah, that that will never change. Like you said, you did force your way in and then you became, if it's possible to become one of the first names on the team sheet under Eddie, you did that. And it led to promotion in that, that first season that he was here, almost unimaginable when you look back to the start of the season. Yeah, yeah, we we never never thought we would kind of go up and go up that year, but the run that we went on, I don't know how many games, it was 23, 24 unbeaten at the time. Uh, even to then nearly messing up and going a few games without winning. So, an unbelievable turnaround. Uh, but like I said before in the interview, it was, the squad that we had was 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 really really strong in League One, um, really strong. Obviously, Brett coming in like, like we signed Brett Pittman from from Bristol City. It was like, oh, there's no way he's coming here. Like we we heard, and he obviously turned up and he was fired us up into the Championship. And where where can we go? You know, like everyone was so excited. You know, Brett Pittman, Lewis grabbing up front, like. What a combination! Um, Matt Ritchie comes in with Simon Francis, who was uh, unbelievable. For Chaz and Puy on the left, Harry Arter in the middle. You know, it was uh, Tommy obviously leading the leading the team. Um, obviously, H ratting around doing what he was doing. Uh, we had we had an unbelievable squad, uh, and it was Eddie and you know the people in the background bought a perfect squad. Uh, assembled a perfect squad and you know um, it transpired from being like well, have we come? I don't think we can go up this year to how can we not go up and it just goes to show that after seeing the, the players careers after after that it just goes to show how strong we were in League One Now you finished 10th in the club's first season back in the second flight you had to sit out eight games due to injury but you more than played your part did you ever imagine that the next season would go the way it did? No, not really, but the way we finished that season was we used to blow teams out of the water early. Um, so I don't think we, we realised what we could potentially do the season after, but we realised that it was clicking, you know. Um, we thought we'd make the playoffs that year, to be honest with you, but we left it probably a little bit too late. Um, but again, after that season, the, the players that we brought in to the squad, not just footballing capabilities, was personalities as well, was was incredible. That first season in the Championship, obviously we had a few periods where we struggled. But once we got to the gri got to grips of, you know, playing these big teams, we, not in Forest and, and whatnot, you were going, going to, it was daunting. I remember one article that year, the first year, and we was like, they're, they're disrespecting us, whoever wrote this disrespected us and we kind of felt like we ended up drawing the game purely last minute I think it was uh, and it was like right we got we, we have to do something about this like we're we're good like we're better than these teams so let's not be mugged off by because these teams get 25 30,000 people the journalists think they can a little because we was a smaller club but we were still a better team so it was like right let's go and prove them um, and we have done the club that ever since the club has always kind of proved people wrong. Halfway through that 2013-14 season, Adam Smith joined the club. Obviously, someone that's still here now, a, a great character. What was his banter like in those days? Well, Smithy actually went two weeks with no one speaking to him, <laughs> 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 and I felt really bad for him. But obviously, the lads Harry knew him before, so there's a thing in football called eggy boff. Like Peter Crouch speaks about it in his podcast, and it's a true thing. So if someone says like. So Smithy got Eggy Boffed, so Harry Arthur said, right, Eggy Boff, Adam Smith, which means you cannot talk to him. You can't speak to him. Anyway, so <laughs> after that, Smudge actually went, oh, I, can't, I just thought you was all rude and like, oh, no. and he was like, no, nah, Smudge, you were, you were like Eggy Boff, you weren't allowed to, if someone spoke to you, they were like getting it. So, and he loved it. That, that's him. Like he loves, he loves that. He's, Smithy is a dying breed in football. He is brilliant, like brilliant. He's the most annoying person I've ever met, but I love him. He's one of them, like he can wind anyone up on the football pitch, off the football pitch. He's brilliant. He's a, he's a great guy. 
um, great footballer, obviously. Really enjoyed kind of my career alongside him because he's he's got energy on and off the pitch and he's a, he's a fantastic lad. So um, he added, yeah, very to a, a good, he made a good dressing room, very good. Uh, and the way he handled that was, I think, just goes to show <laughs> he, he's just he, he's just a top guy. Now, your eye for a spectacular goal was witnessed by our travelling supporters when you st- scored a stunning overhead kick during a 2-2 draw away at Ipswich. That's surely one to uh, to save for the grandkids, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know how I died. I think we, are, we arrived about 15 minutes before kick-off that game because the coach driver took us down. <laughs> the coach driver shredded our bus. He took us down a, um, <laughs> a country lane, which was just like trees. And so there was sky on the TV, right, there, there's, on the bus there's sky, but the satellite was gone, right? That was, it was an absolute nightmare. He then dropped us to the wrong side of the stadium. We ran across, got changed, got, came out. We was never good at, we were never great at Ipswich, ever. <laughs> I don't know, it was a lovely day. I think we played Sheffield Wednesday on a Friday before. It was like that, that um, Easter, Easter, period where he played too quite quickly uh so we arrived and we were like, we're not ready for this like and then somehow I've produced a overhead kick and nearly broke my back and whatnot but yeah it was a, it was a nice goal um yeah it goes down in nice in the portfolio of, of goals and I'll take one of them now let me tell you who was the last eggy boff Dan Hodges, maybe. <laughs> Someone Eggy Boff, Dan Hodges is warm up. Um, <laughs> and it didn't go down well with Eddie. Let me tell you, didn't go down because no one moved. No one moved. And Dan was fuming because obviously the management forced the players to run and it felt like he, he was belittled to, and he couldn't control the lad, so he wasn't happy. Um, yeah, it's a, it's not a good. It's not. You don't want to be eggy boffed, especially if you've got a strong group behind you. Now, as this is our Christmas edition of the podcast, do the players indulge in Secret Santa? <sighs> no, the last Secret Santa I was in was when I first signed, and I can't. That was led by Warren Cummins, Sean Cooper, Fletch. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the first and last one I've been involved in and it wasn't a good one to be involved in so I'm quite glad because it can be horrible but I think it should be brought back um, so maybe I'll have a word um, but yeah back then it was, it was not nice I won't ask you why <laughs> no, it was cancelled I won't go into that no, no, no. War- Warren Cummins knows we'll change tack quickly now children you became a father to Frey in 2015 and Eden in 2017. How did that, has that changed your life? Yeah, a lot, a lot, because now football, I used to play football for football enjoyment, you know, uh, without realising kind of what I have to do. It is my job. It's a very short career. Um, now I play the game to produce a future for them uh, to they love it they love it Frey is very very emotional the oldest one he's he's six now and he I couldn't believe he, he's, he's taken obviously myself not being involved and not being playing football to heart more than me and it's been really it's been a really difficult kind of four or five months being a dad with him because he's Used to be coming to football every Saturday. Now he, he wasn't. He wouldn't come. He wouldn't go and watch. If I wasn't, he, he felt like I think he felt hard done by that I was out of the team. So he wouldn't come and watch, which was sad because he loves Bournemouth. Like loves it. Um, so that was really difficult for myself. And so that was my motivation to get back in the team to kind of I wanted him to see me play because we had we had. A season and a half, or two, two, season and a half with no fans, so they couldn't watch anyway. So then, when the fans came back, I wasn't in the team. It was difficult. So, yeah, I, I'm really pleased for for them because they love watching. So, I've my man of the match award 
<laughs> from Fridays in his bedroom is like a like a shrine. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really pleased with them that I've kind of managed to get back in the team because they love football, they love Bournemouth. Um, they really enjoy kind of playing the game. My aspects of of football have changed because I want to have a long career to provide for them. So if I don't play well, I'm, I'm out of contract in the summer. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to play well, trying to earn a contract um, kind of ultimately for them really. So yeah, it's changed me uh, humongously. Did you take your turn at changing dirty nappies? Yeah, I was hands on. I'm, a ha- I'm I was always hands on. Didn't enjoy it, obviously. But I was, uh, I've always been. If I'm there, I, I put everything into it. So yeah, I was I was hands on. Um, but I wouldn't have a third one. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> I wouldn't have a third kid. So uh, I put the, the nappies behind me. Kick arounds in the garden. In the, the local park and stuff like that, all that you would have done as a kid with your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's difficult because coming from games and they're they're full on. They're, they're or coming from training. Their day starts when I get home. So I remember last year we played Watford here, sunny day, knackered, early kick off. Then I'm out doing another hour and a half in the garden playing football. So it's hard. It's really it's really enjoyable. I love it. I lo- I love seeing. I would never force them to. I, I, I would never force them to play football. I didn't. Would never push them down. Yeah, they're only four and six, so they might kind of dislike football in years to come. But they love it. They're they're on it. They want to be in the garden. They're playing football in the house, and it's actually really nice to see them improve. Um, so Fraser at Southampton Pre Academy, um, at the moment, which is controversial maybe. Um, and to see him actually improve over the weeks and whatnot is, is really nice. I think we need to bring the podcast to an end there, if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at six, at six, you know, he might, he, he, you never know, he, he might, he might be a player or not. But it, the only reason he he's gone there, I think, because of Bournemouth had a bit of a transitional period with a uh, yeah, that's my excuse as well. Um, no, he, he he just wants to play football. He was a, a, a scout come up to him and, and said, "We want to come along." It was brilliant. Like he plays every so often, uh, plays for Wimborne and Holt. Uh, I love watching him. I like really kind of seeing the the improvements that they they make. Just mixing up the father social media question. As a father, are you worried about social media for your kids as they grow up? Yeah. Uh, as much as I kind of think it is a great platform, yeah, a hundred percent. I'm worried for them in general. You know, I think uh, like every parent, doesn't matter when they were born. You know, you always got the worries of of what your child's going to do or what they're going to pick up and what they're going to learn. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how you. I don't know how you combat that. Um, it's something that. Sometimes you can't fight. Um, you know, I, I didn't. He plays FIFA. And he's six. I think how have let that happen? But everyone's doing it. You know, the kids are kids. Are, it's frightening. Um, I think a modern day child is so different to kind of how it used to be. So kind of learning on the job in terms of social media technology, um, what's right and what's wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, I think being a parent. Is it's getting harder <laughs> now going back to the football you were ever present during the championship winning campaign of 2014-15 when did you ever fully think that that Premier League dream could be a reality uh, was there any particular point in that season was it towards the end was it when it actually happened I don't think I ever appreciated or ever I can't I, I'd love to put myself back in my mind that then I don't. you know when you don't know what's out there you don't really have an opinion on it I never knew how big the Premier League was. I always used to play football in a blasé sort of way. And I didn't really worry about what was happening. Um, which is, I'm like, come on, like, why, why did I feel like that? But maybe that's changed with kind of you know, the maturity of my game and my person, my personality. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't. 
I can't tell you when. Because I remember walking into the Bolton game, just not even realising what was, not, not, not realising, but not appreciating kind of what was what was ready, what was ready out there for for the team and the benefits and the exposure, which I think is a nice way. I think you should, I listened to Johnny Wilkinson's podcast. He's like, you should play sport as you used to as a kid. Just go out and enjoy it. So maybe that's where I was at then. Totally different now. But I think there's a positive and a negative. Um, so yeah, I don't really know, to be honest. The likes of Callum Wilson, Jan Kermigant, Matt Ritchie, Brett Pittman, they all hit double figures that season. What was Jan like off the pitch? Jan, he was such a good guy. An unbelievable player. Uh, you know, he was our own Cantona. He was, he was brilliant. A great guy. Um, fantastic footballer. Um, timing wise, I, I think, he was unlucky because he was, his his real potential didn't come out until later in his career. He, he was a perfect match for our team at the time. Um, a top 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 striker obviously could play number 9 10 could play anywhere really um, and very underrated kind of in the footballing world I think um, and a shame that he never kind of got to the top as quicker because I think he would have been a top top uh, Premier League striker Now we've asked previous guests on the podcast about that open top bus parade and the celebrations after it what can you tell us about the squad's trip to Las Vegas or is it very much a case of what happens on tour stays uh, on tour? Vegas was was mental. So we actually took two flights out. So a few went on Wednesday and a few went on Thursday, I think it was. And the second flight, I remember the flight, because it's typical, we, we got to Vegas and the weather was terrible, like winds. It was like, what's going on? Like, we're on, this is meant to be like desert. It's meant to be roasting. We arrived. And then the other lads arrived and their plane, was, they were like shaken because their plane on the way down and he got blown back to England. Like it was, I remember Ian Hart, Andy Sam <laughs> arriving at a pool party and they were like, lads, like, we can't enjoy today. We've, we've nearly like been blown off the runway, we're, like traumatized. <laughs> and it was, it was random because the weather was terrible. I always remember it was terrible, but we had, a, we had an unbelievable time. Um, kind of our group was, to, was was really really strong um yeah, ryan fraser was terrific you know um re- i'm always remember ringing charlie daniels like Chaz, where are you i'm at a hotel it's like where are I, what hotel are you at i was like we man you're, you're not there mate. and he had no clue where he was he was like he was i think about three miles down the road thinking he was in our hotel and he was uh no we had we had a r- good group great trip away that we we deserved and Kind of, I think that kind of bonded us even more because we we come back and we was like, right, we're ready to go. We've had a good time. Now, now let's crack on. Did you break the bank in Las Vegas? Did you bump into any celebrities out there? I don't think we did actually. No, um, I think we just we got there and that was it. You know, it was the, the our celebrities at the time were the Fulham team. We saw the Fulham team at Cormac and we was like, right, you've got you've got us promoted. So like, let's go. They were, I remember it was Ben Ellie, Cormac and someone else because obviously the Middlesbrough game for them when they sent their keeper forward, didn't they? And McCormack obviously rolled it in and kind of more or less got us promoted. So yeah, there there was our big celebrities out there then. Scott Parker there? I don't know actually. I don't know. You have to ask him. I'm not sure. Um, he might well have been, yeah. Now, before the season started... Did you ever think the the boy from Hastings? This is going to be a little bit too much for me, a, too much of a step. Let's face it, Benteke, Sterling, Rooney, and Rashford on a weekly basis is completely different to what you were up against in the Championship. Originally, no, I thought right, I'm going to attack this. Like, I'm going to really enjoy it. And then a few games in, a few performances. I think after the Norwich game, I was like, yeah, this, this might be kind of a step too far for me. I thought. Because you can play well on a one-off game, like we've seen it loads of times. You know, FA Cups, you can play against Premier League teams and you do well. I thought, well, maybe that's the case with me because I've done had a few games here and there that was all right. And Norwich away, it was like, oh, what's going on? 
they come up with us and they absolutely blitzed us. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely I had that. Um, but then I had to kind of try and learn about myself and like, the, you know, like mental weaknesses and ways to improve. Um, and the club had a guy, they brought someone in and I ended up reluctantly speaking to him because I thought, ah, oh, I don't need to. And then I did. And I remember we played Everton here. Was it first season when the the free all? Everton here, I got dragged at half time. I got abused. Abused at half time by the manager and full time. Full time one, I'm blaming on Silva and Distan because I'd taken an absolute hammering, hammering by Eddie. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> How do you come back from that? Anyway, half full time, bad lads are buzzing because we've drawn three all. <laughs> and Sil said something. <laughs> and it was like the parting of the Red Sea because everyone just went, Phew, and it was just me and Eddie again. <laughs> and he absolutely come for me round two. I was like, Sil, come on, mate. You've absolutely you tried being nice there, but you've you've done me. And I thought I genuinely thought, right, that's me done. I thought, I can't, that's no way I'm playing. <laughs> There's no way I'm playing again after that. Because not many people come back from that. <laughs> it was a it was a big one. Times two. And then when people say like there's there's kind of fate and whatnot, for myself it was like right. Hadn't been told, but I was out of the team for Chelsea away. So Sylvan and, and, and Frano were playing. The Sylv got food poisoning on a Friday night and I played. We won one nil. And then we beat Man United. Again, after that, then we beat West Brom and it was like, so when I talk about luck, obviously not great for Sylvan, but my luck was was up. Someone wanted me to play that game and I, I played and never looked back in, in the Premier League. My confidence kind of grew. I then believed that I could play and, and I played for five years in the Premier League. So yeah, it went from being my real low point by getting absolutely slaughtered twice to keeping a clean sheet at Chelsea and winning one nil so uh, only in football eh? Absolutely now you are, you did quickly adjust and you had a great first season finishing 16th in the end of, for a first season in the Premier League it was a, it was quite an achievement Simon Francis and Andrew Sermon played every minute of every game that season now a bit of a curveball question which one of those two would you choose as your navigator if you were a rally driver? Frano Hundred percent, sirs. I can trust sirs. I mean, that was my navigator. Hundred percent. He'd get distracted by something. <laughs> I love sirs. 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 Again, a Bournemouth player that never really got the kind of send off that he deserved because of the COVID situation. Same as Frano, but Frano's obviously still here now. But sirs, what an unbelievable footballer. It takes a good player to be voted by the players player of the season in a championship winning season when you have the numbers that the other players did so it just goes to show how appreciated he was in the dressing room as a footballer um, I'm pretty sure the fans appreciated him as a, as a player too uh, but seriously underrated and a real shame he never got the send off he deserved I think from the club going along with probably Chaz Frano they deserved it too um, but yeah I'm, I'm picking Frano because yeah I can't trust Sirs to be switched on when it really matters in a, in a car <laughs> <laughs> now then you scaled new heights in the 2016-17 season a club record ninth place finish in the Premier League you played every minute of that season in the Premier League now one of your two goals was that epic 4-3 game against Liverpool you scored that third one to put us back on level terms was that your best season? Yeah by a mile by a mile um, that was a big season for myself um, and a disappointing thing for me in, in that I had a good season and then I thought right I'll go again and I didn't give myself a summer I, I trained so hard and killed myself I burnt myself out like I started the season I'd signed a good uh, a new contract at the club there was opportunities for me elsewhere um, good ones at the time which I was 
made me more like right come on like you can go again you can kind of see kind of where I can take my game to and I trained far too hard in the summer I think I've, I trained it more or less every day and I come back to pre-season I was done it was a ridiculous thing um, I was running on the beach and this occlusion thing that we used to do like the bands around your legs and they used to it takes the blood from stops the kind of the, the blood flow it's good for rehab but you know in a pre-season it's mental and you kind of train with that jumps and runs and whatnot and it just finished my legs and yeah pre-season was I was really poor coming back from from that my, my form tied in with having a second kid because I probably wasn't sleeping as well I'd do the Monday Tuesday Wednesday help out go to sleep on Thursday and Friday and wake up Saturday and like need more sleep and I was obviously a bit fatigued plus lack of sleep and I had one yeah it was a real shame um, took me a good couple of months to kind of get back to where I wanted to be physically and you know it was a shame because I tried kind of too hard um, where you kind of should just trust trust the program that you get given by the club but you know you won a lot of awards after finishing like that season do you still have those awards whereabouts are they are they in your, your kids bedrooms yeah yeah um, I still have them obviously uh, big moment you know the the award I won for, for, the, for the Echo is kind of massive massive for Bournemouth players um, the defenders that have won that over the years it's, it's huge so I had myself on that and a, a winner of that it kind of if I ever leave the club and knowing I've won that it makes me pleased I kind of accomplished I, I put that right up there with, with winning uh, winning the championship because as a player accolade playing for this club having the fans vote that that's a real nice thing for me and you obviously have to give it back because it's a shame <laughs> so I've got nothing to show for it but the historic side the knowing that I've been a winner knowing that Tommy Elphick Eddie Howe Simon Francis you know year players gone back in the day the big big players for the club have won it and I'm, I'm a part of that makes me makes me proud Married in the summer of 2017 to Laura. Life must have been complete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, nice happened quick, you know. Um, it was something that I never really saw myself as a, as a young person getting married young. Um, I've come from, but saying that my my mum and dad been married. It was our anniversary the other day. Married years, years, years. Old school relationship. Um, so yeah, no, we had, we had the kid. Um, wanted to kind of nail down, you know, um, Laura having the same name as me, moving forward together. Um, my family now drive me. Uh, like I said before, so um, I think having a settled family um, helps massively. Um, I think when she moved down to, to Bournemouth, she's a London girl, so when she moved down to Bournemouth, she didn't quite know what was what she was moving to, the hustle and bustle of London down to, to Bournemouth. Um, been here for uh, eight years now. Um, knew nothing about football then apparently now she could run a football club uh, so yeah that's um, yeah the success I've had on the pitch and, and whatnot I put obviously put down to the family side as well um, the tough times I've had kind of this year as well so I think uh, having a solid family having a, that that relationship you know is only good now the life of a footballer normally involves moving here, there, and everywhere, up and down the country. You you must consider yourself quite fortunate to have been married, had kids, and been somewhere so long. Because whilst that's a two way street, and you you've been loyal, also um, you've been fortunate as well in a way. One hundred percent, especially on the kids' side. Um, the school school in here is, is amazing. Um, the life you get living down here is lovely. You know, living by the sea. Um, the freshness, the people, um, so lucky. Uh, I appreciated living here, you know, during that lockdown period. Um, 
so fresh, amazing places to to walk to down the beach. You know, um, the lifestyle here is is matches my kind of personality. I feel like I want to, you know, you, you don't want things too intense. You you want to live a nice life outside of football as well. So, um, like I say, when I first moved here, I loved it. Um, and ten years later, I I love the area. I love the place. Um, so yeah, I, I, do I see myself living here forever? A hundred percent. You know, I could commit to 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 live in in this town. I live in Paul, so um, I, I love it. So um, I wouldn't change anything. You know, I wouldn't. You, in football, yeah, you, players have careers. They're moving here, there, and everywhere. I've been lucky. I'm thirty. Who knows? But I would love to my my base always be be down here. Now a real goosebumps moment for all Bournemouth supporters was the winning goal in injury time away at Newcastle that following season. Now I want to ask you if you'd have done that now against Newcastle, what would Eddie Howe be like in the change room at the end of the game to his Newcastle players to have conceded that goal? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to know because I've been on the end of it and. I wouldn't wish it on the players. But let me tell you, I'll be celebrating. And I'll be letting them I'll, I'll be letting them know that I'd I'd done them. <laughs> so <laughs> you in the opposition changing room will be giving it stacks. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, you'd yeah. also be listening and what would he be like? I would be I'd be scoring the goal and, and my celebration would veer, you know, to the, to their dugout and just a little jog past. And then I'd maybe on the way, and if I walk past the Newcastle players, be like that, be ready. And then have my ear to cut my ear to the the change room wall and see what's going on. <laughs> now, you've said about incurring his wrath at that Everton game. Yeah. How was he when you handled the ball at Norwich? <sighs> yeah, that was um, totally different. Totally different. Obviously, after the game, I was very emotional and kind of had to. Uh, I apologised to obviously everyone. Um, moment of obviously madness. Then I kind of left it a day, and then went and saw the manager and apologised to to him and obviously letting him down. Started off okay, and then obviously ended up not being okay. So then I was back in there the next day again um, trying to kind of yeah I was, it was a real real strange one obviously to this day I had no clue what I was doing ridiculous um, let obviously the travelling fans down that day I've received obviously a lot of messages of not me not nice messages um, because yeah at the time it was, it's an emotional game isn't it uh, so I kind of let everyone down at the club um, and I knew that, so I kind of needed to put things right with with the players and, and with the staff. So obviously, I felt embarrassed, you know. And in in the moments, you know, the outside world, the football world, they love it. You know, it was everywhere. Um, so that was harder because it, you just couldn't escape from it. So it was a difficult, difficult kind of week. Obviously, I was suspended. We beat Brighton the the week after, which was which was nice for me because I was desperate for us to win. It kind of took a little bit of the pressure off. But yeah, it was um, the moments that I had with Eddie of the the bit of roughness we had made our relationship because I always kind of tried to respond. And I think he, I was always willing to listen and, and learn from what he would say. Um, obviously, I respect him and JT and the, the staff then extremely a lot. So my ability to kind of handle that and, and kind of then learn and move on, um, I think was respected by them. Um, handled it like, tried to handle it the best as, as possible and, and, and try improve in training the, the following day or the following week after that. So um, yeah, the, it was difficult. I had a few difficult moments in my Bournemouth career and that was maybe top of the list. Elton John and Phil Collins. Discuss your liking for them. I don't know. I, I love them. 
uh, Queen. I love it. I love that that music, that era. Um, the one thing about the change room, which has gone, is the music. I think it's horrific. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I love that sort of music. And um, yeah, I've got no other answer. I just really enjoy it. I don't know. My mum and dad maybe listen to picking up music they they listen to. My sister does as well. My bro my brothers, you know, they like music. And yeah. That's what I have on in the car quite regularly. What's your favourite Elton John song and your favourite Phil Collins song and your favourite Queen song? Queen, Radio Gaga. Brilliant. Elton John, I'm Still Standing. Or that's why I call it Blues because I used to listen to that one on the way into the, to the game. Phil Collins, I don't know. How, yeah, I like them all. I haven't got a favourite. I like them all. Coaching badges. Where are you and... Where do you think they may take you if you wanted to go down that route? Um, I'm on my A license currently. Um, enjoy it. I've been down in the academy a lot, um, doing it there to kind of, because we don't get days off and current players, you know, we're expected to go to regional days and, and whatnot. But me, myself and Junior are on it together, which helps. Really, really enjoy it. I must say the, the Bournemouth Academy have been brilliant with kind of accommodating me, me and Junior. They've got some great players down there as well. Um, obviously trying to get as much experience as possible. Uh, hopefully I pass, you know, it's a long course. Um, and I, I would love to stay in the game and, and, and kind of learn and coach and and, and what knows um, and who knows. So uh, I would, yeah, I love that side of it. I love kind of learning about the game. I think it benefits me on the pitch as well, the coaching side, because you can see both sides. Um, so yeah. It's, it's it's hard as well because there's a lot of hours a lot of it's on Zoom now as well so you, um, you don't get quite the same feel as you would a couple of years ago um, so it makes it difficult sometimes but it's enjoyable Now then we always end with some questions from our supporters and they're quite quick fire um, and I'm just going to pick a few out because we're running a little bit short of time now Firstly, from our Hong Kong supporter base, they want to know what your favourite goal you've ever scored in a Bournemouth shirt is. We've talked about some classics at like Newcastle one, that, that Ipswich one, I'm sure the one at Fulham stands out as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for the Newcastle one because I'd been out of the team and I kind of felt like I had something to prove. The week building up to that game as well, I didn't think I was playing, so I was like a bit, not angry, but... I was desperate to play and then I found out obviously on the Friday that I was playing so that kind of was still boiling in me and to score a, a last minute winner you know with a clean sheet at, at Newcastle at a huge club at a time when we needed a result was an unbelievable feeling um, scoring header centre half scoring headers that's what it's all about um, yeah amazing feeling um hard to kind of choose. it wasn't obviously the best goal I've scored but it meant the most to me one from Jack Smith on Facebook Bournemouth Beach or Brighton Beach oh, it's no brainer Bournemouth is you could take a picture down on Bournemouth Beach in the sun and you could be anywhere in the world it's, it's amazing even though it does get very busy so I'd like a little spot to myself So, but that'd be asking a bit too much but no Bournemouth Beach another one on Facebook this one's from Heather I think I might know the answer. What's your favourite coffee shop in Bournemouth? I'll give the Ounce Boys a shout out. Um, Ounce in Westbourne. It's uh, lovely, lovely coffee and great lads. Really enjoy it there. And just one final one, which has come from Harry, also on Facebook. What did the lads think when you turned up with bleach blonde hair at the start of a pre-season one year? <laughs> I think slightly they rated me for it. Um, Simon Francis was actually come up to me and said what are you doing I was like what do you mean he's like you, the manager is not going to like it I was like oh come on like his haircut or hair um, colour and Eddie walked in he was like I like that I like it I was like there we go Frano what, what do you know and it, I think it actually it uh, made a lot of people smile and the manager liked it so I take it well, there we go. If the manager liked it, it's uh, it's got the seal of approval. Well, Cookie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us. We've enjoyed your company and your stories and looking back over you for your career today. So thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me on. Brilliant. Thank you.
Now, if you've joined, enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could give us a like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it FC Bournemouth related or just the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Steve Cook and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.